All right, so today I'm interested in the question of political unity, particularly Hobbes' question of where political unity comes from, a real unity of them all that constitutes a community. And my basic analogy for this discussion is going to be a Chinese fairy tale where a man's wife is taken up to heaven, but he's still permitted to visit her with his children as long as he can climb along a sort of flock of birds, of starlings, uh, which seems like a very inadequate ladder, but somehow it holds together enough for him to make his visits with his children. So I'll begin with the very earthly side of this, the descriptive accounts. So descriptive accounts of political unity have really been popularized by John Searle, and they constitute this kind of basic double framework. First of all, there's a kind of a declaratory speech act, something like, I'm the king, and here's the boundary of my kingdom, or he's the prince, he's next in line to be king when I die, that kind of thing. And then there's a collective individual acceptance of those speech acts. So the various people in the putative kingdom have to just kind of nod and say, yeah, yeah, I guess that's right. I guess he is the king, or I guess that is the boundary of the kingdom. They have to go along with it. It doesn't need to be a verbal acceptance, but it needs to be um, somehow within their minds. And this account fits very well with the existing theories we have of speech acts. It works exactly like Austin's original claims around bets. Someone has to make a wager. I bet uh, so much money on the game, and then that bet has to be somehow accepted. So there's a very familiar philosophical framework here. And that framework, it seems to me, has at least two fruitful offspring. The first is naturalism. So how here proceeds why? We can see how someone becomes king. He's made the speech act declaration and that speech act declaration has been accepted without knowing why he would want to be king, why someone might be willing to accept that, whether it's a good thing that he's the king, whether a kingdom is a good form of government or anything else like that. And that's really valuable for any kind of uh, you know, research uh, sociological explanation because it seems like in order to even ask the why questions, why did they choose this guy or were they right to do so, you have to already be able to identify who is the king. Why did they choose this one? Uh, were they right to choose this one? If you can't even identify the king, if you haven't answered the how question first, it's unclear how you can even ask the why questions. And so from a research methodology perspective, it seems like this kind of descriptive account is extremely attractive. Another reason that it's attractive from a naturalistic perspective is that it doesn't imply any state of nature. So humans are presumably linguistic animals from the beginning. They're capable of intentional cognitive acts from the beginning from as long as there have been humans. And so we don't need to posit any kind of state of nature. As long as language has existed, people have been able to make various kinds of speech act declarations and the people have been able to accept them. And so we don't need to posit some kind of before perspective where there is some kind of uh, critical mass of civilization infrastructure before we could actually have uh, government or political unity. We can just say that political unity evolved from simpler forms to grander forms as we went from I'm the chief or I'm the big man uh, up through, you know, I'm the king to I'm the president and uh, without any kind of positive state of nature, which is great because states of nature are kind of infamously mythical and not really susceptible to empirical investigation. The second fruit, it seems to me, of descriptive accounts is a kind of realism. So if we're able to say that there is in fact a political unity before we have to ask whether it's a good one, then that can kind of temper our expectations of intervention. So the photo here is a photo of Aleppo and Syria, which has been infamously destroyed over the last years as part of a struggle and conflict that involves international intervention. And of course, the point is that the regime in Syria is not a good one. 
And so if you just focus on the, the normative part, you can say, well, they don't, you know, Assad doesn't have any rightful authority, and so we're free to go in and interfere as we might. But if we focus, as the descriptive accounts encourages us, on just the fact that Assad has authority, whether or not it's rightful, then we can see that intervening uh, is bringing in a second authority and adding to the chaos rather than merely righting wrongs. It doesn't mean intervention is never appropriate, but it does mean that we should think about what the authorities actually are and include that in our analysis before we just worry about whether those authorities are rightful and whether or not we should want to right those wrongs. So that handles the kind of earthly side of this. Uh, we have a descriptive account based on speech acts, and that descriptive account brings significant benefits that make it earthly, that it's, it's naturalist and it's realist, and that makes it very suitable for the kind of social science picture that we want to have grounding our social ontology. But the next step that we want is to have that naturalist grounded account somehow reach the heavens normative. So if Searle has given us this picture of a descriptive account, let's look to Margaret Gilbert to see why that descriptive account needs to reach a more normative picture. And the vision that Margaret Gilbert gives us is one based on the legend of the emperor with no clothes. So here, right, the story goes that uh, you have the emperor, some kind of con man comes to him and convinces him that, uh, you know, he can sell him a, a beautiful set of clothes. Um, and the fact that he can't see it is no worry because everyone else can see it. It's only he who can't see it. And so he should wear these kind of beautiful clothes and leave the big parade. And for a while, this goes very well uh, for the con man and, and the emperor, I suppose, because everyone is too afraid of contradicting the emperor to say that he's not wearing any clothes. So they all just go along with it. Some of them decide to embrace this new fashion as well. Uh, they're all happy and clapping for his beautiful suit during the parade. Until one day, of course, a little boy just points and says, oh, you're not wearing anything. It's a sham. You've been conned. And then everyone else can no longer hold in their laughter, no longer go along with the charade, and the whole thing falls apart for both the con man and the emperor. And this is Gilbert's worry about Searle's account. If everything's just based on a speech act and an individual acceptance with no kind of normative component, then it seems like the individuals are free to take back their acceptance at any time. If there's no need for me to accept the speech act, no reason why I ought to do so, then there's no reason why I can't just later decide not to. Initially, perhaps I accepted that this man was the king, but now I don't like him so much. And uh, maybe I'm, you know, the House of Lancaster. And so I think, well, whatever. He's not, he's not my king anymore. And in fact, this makes him not my king anymore, since the only thing that made him my king in the first place was my acceptance of his speech act that he's king. As soon as I've rescinded that acceptance, he's not my king anymore. Unfortunately, this seems this lack of normativity in the descriptive account seems to undermine the very realist root of the account. We wanted an account where we could say that someone was the king, whether or not that was a good thing. But now we recognize that as soon as individuals uh, decide that it's not a good thing, they can just rescind the grounds for the description. And so again, we're left with a chaotic situation where there's not really any grounds for agreement about whether someone's the king. You still think it's a good thing, and so he's still your king. I don't think it's a good thing. He's no longer my king. And there's no real way of settling uh, this dispute, nothing we can further appeal to, because the only grounds for his being the king in the first place was each of our individual acceptances of that fact. So without normativity, it's not just that we don't have some kind of high in the sky goal, we really don't have the fundamental uh, goal of the descriptive account to get us some kind of stable reality that we can study. So somehow we need to bring Searle's descriptive account with its basic fruits up towards the normative vision that Margaret Gilbert uh, lays out, this need for some kind of real joint commitment that binds us together. 
And we need to do that without falling to the earth below. And that danger, that danger of falling seems to me to be a question of methodological individualism. That's what we're trying not to fall into. Because on, on Searle's account, everything is just a matter of supervenience, right? The whole reason that we need to deal with individual acceptance is because social groups supervene on organisms. And so if we try to deal with the social group, the political unity, in some way that doesn't just supervene on each of our individual acceptances, then he's worried, well, we won't have supervenience. We won't be moving in a methodologically rigorous way because we're trying to appeal to something other than the organism, other than the individuals to explain the social group, when in fact the social group really is just a set of organisms behaving in a certain way. So that's the barrier. The question is how we can overcome that. And of course, one reason we might think about higher groups in the first place is this idea of a kind of downward causal influence. So we need to worry about how we get a downward causal influence in the first place and how we can get a downward causal influence that doesn't just depend on those individual organisms, which are free to kind of a lot of the social group at any time. So that's what we're trying to avoid is that, that kind of methodological individualism. We need to overcome that methodological individualism if we're going to join our descriptive account to a really profoundly normative account. And so I'd like to pull together a kind of flock of birds to do that, a kind of metaphysics, which might seem a little thin, but I think is enough to do the job. And that is based on the order is sustaining end account that I'm going to provide. So order is sustaining end is, is built on a kind of Avicennian metaphysics developed by Rob Coons. And the first part of that uh, account is the basic idea of emergence. So we have individuals and they are somehow sustaining a collective, but that collective also in some way sustains the individual. And the trick here is, of course, not to have a, just a circularity problem. And the way we avoid circularity is actually by understanding that the collective is supported synchronically by the individuals. So this is, this is really Searle's account, right? That is the individual acceptances right now which ground the collective. It's because each of us believes that this man is king, that he is the king. It's a synchronic relation and it's supervening on our individual mental states. However, in this view, there's also a space for a diachronic relation where there's something about the collective, the behavior of the collective, that gives the individuals a normative reason to continue to have this synchronic mental state. So let's look at what, what these look like. So, the problem, so here I'm going to invoke Mancourt Olson's idea of, of the formation of the state by a banditry. And so here we have a picture of the Great Wall of China, of course, keeping out the hordes. And the idea is that the fundamental uh, basic situation of, of human beings uh, without much of a state is banditry, where people are just trying to attack us, steal our stuff and the fruits of our labor. And uh, that's obviously really uh, bad for us. We want some kind of big man to protect us. And this happens, of course, this doesn't, we don't do appeal to state of nature because this happens even in the animal world with chimpanzee groups and things like that. So banditry is bad is what we're trying to avoid. How do we avoid that kind of banditry? Well, we avoid it by a kind of adopting a stationary bandit, someone who might be extracted from us all the time, a kind of chief that we have to pay, you know, rents to all the time. But the advantage of that chief is because he's a, a stable uh, leader, he isn't going to extract as much as, as the bandit does. He wants to leave us enough to live for another day and pay rent another day. Whereas the, the roving bandit has no such attachment and is happy to just clean us out. So there's a kind of attachment to this uh, stationary bandit over the roving bandit. That's Matt Corlson's story about state formation. And it's, as you can see, it's a naturalistic one. It doesn't imply anything about um, some kind of advanced cognitive capacities. But why should we accept this particular uh, stationary bandit? This, this guy doesn't have any normative power over us originally, 
He's just protecting us from the roving bandit, but only for his own self-interested ends, not for any grand normative reasons. And here uh, I give you a picture of uh, a Gallic warlord uh, surrendering, surrendering to Caesar. Why is he surrendering to Caesar? Well, not because he thinks Caesar is just, you know, a great guy. Uh, you know, he, of course, thinks kind of deep in his heart that, you know, somehow he's the rightful chief of the Gauls and he doesn't want to surrender to Caesar. But Caesar's going to give him something. What's Caesar going to give him? Well, if this guy surrenders to Caesar, then Caesar agrees to not massacre all his people, to continue to feed uh, his uh, wife and children, whether he, he continues to fight, then all everything's off the table. And so Caesar's providing a kind of rudimentary justice in this situation. He's providing the goods of life. And we don't need to think of that in any kind of super rich, thick way. It's just the way that the, the lead chimpanzee helps make sure that the rest of them get fed and protected. And so even though this isn't kind of normative at the start, it's just based on each party's self-interest. Caesar's just being self-interested in trying to conquer Gaul. This guy's just being self-interested in wanting to surrender so that his offspring are not, you know, murdered. But nonetheless, this gives him a genuinely normative reason to surrender. If he doesn't surrender, we can say he's doing something bad. He's doing something bad in forsaking the goals that he wants to achieve, uh, the good of his offspring. Uh, if he doesn't surrender, those, those are forsaken. Whereas if he surrenders, if he accepts this kind of new regime, uh, then he has a normative norm reason to accept that new regime to achieve these ends. So what the, the emergent collective is providing is a kind of a basic justice, a distribution of the goods of life, and that gives people a normative reason to continue to synchronically accept the speech acts that create the collective. So Caesar says, I'm the Lord of Gaul. This uh, Gallic chief has a reason to accept that. And so the, the collective uh, continues to operate. And so I think this is actually all we need to get from the descriptive normative accounts. So we have here the benefit of the descriptive account. All we have is people acting in their self-interest using the basic rudiments of language. We don't need any kind of prior idea that Caesar's a good guy or anything like that. Um, and yet, we achieve normativity. The, Gal the Gallic chieftain can't just, uh, well, he can go back on his word, but he has a, a, a reason not to. And if he just says, oh, Caesar's not my chief anymore, people can say, oh, it's actually bad to say that. Because if you do that, then you're sacrificing the goods of life for your people. You're, you're doing something bad. And therefore, if we argue about whether Caesar is Lord of Gaul, you have some reason to say that I'm wrong to rescind my acceptance. There's some kind of normative component to my continued acceptance. And so even within a completely naturalistic framework, we've succeeded in achieving a kind of realist vision where not only can people who are even evil people like Caesar be genuinely in charge, uh, thereby securing a kind of unified political picture, but also, we can't. We have some basis for arguing about whether that person is really in charge. Are they continuing to distribute the goods of life? If yes, they're still really in charge, even if we think that's a bad thing and we would rather someone else be in charge, that person's still in charge for now. There's still a real political unity. And so that seems enough to me to meet Hobbes' criteria. We have a kind of real unity of them all, based on distributing the goods of life, but the, the reason that, that that distribution of the goods of life uh, convinces us um, to, to accept political order is, is based on a completely descriptive fact about what's good for us and leads our individual acceptances. Uh, and therefore, we have a completely descriptive account where the social uh, order is still relying on the individual order, even though there's an emergent aspect whereby the, the social order is giving a reason to the individual level to continue to uh, accept it in that way. 